Hello, everybody. I'm John Atak, and my my faithful assistant Spike Robinson is with me today. Um, and uh, we we have been stirred to to make this recording by a case currently um, exploding into the media uh, in Utah, um, which involves a woman called Ruby Frankie, who used to run a YouTube channel called Eight Passengers, which had about 2 million subscribers. And she was called Eight Passengers because it's her, her husband and their six children. Now, she threw her husband out 13 months ago, and he claims innocence about any of the events that have occurred. But what's happened is that um, her 12 year old son crept out of the basement of the house where it appears he was being imprisoned and pleaded with the neighbor for food and drink. Uh, the neighbor called the police and said, I have this emaciated 12 year old who has uh, duct tape on his wrists and has marks from having been bound uh, on his legs as well. So um, this leads us to the subject of child abuse in cults and to what extent we should be pressuring government and local agencies to, to take more action and have more concern. In this case, the, the group involved is the Latter-day Saints, um, much more commonly referred to as the Mormons. Um, and tell us about, because uh, this was the house of her friend that, that this... Her friend? And, and when they got there, they found there was also a 10-year-old girl who was being yes. apparently um, held up. His younger sister. Uh, his it's her friend and business partner Jody Hildebrandt. She stopped the eight passengers after I think shortly after or shortly before breaking up with the husband, mm -hmm. and has been working with her partner Jody Hildebrandt doing this marriage and addiction, and we'll round back to that in a moment. Therapy program called Connections, spelled with an X. Misspelled yeah. with an X. Mix, misspelled <laughs> with an X. Now, I have been doing some admittedly not as thorough as I'd like research, but pretty widespread. And it seems that in this connections program, masturbation, even if you're doing it only once a month, is viewed as an addiction. Porn, even if you're just looking at Playboy for the articles, is an addiction. And the wives have been reportedly and uh, if you, somebody knows differently, please correct us, mm -hmm. um, told to withhold sex, affection, and even their presence from their husbands if they engage or fall off the wagon, as it were. Yeah, so you, you just masturbated, no sex for you. It's like, um, the, 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 yeah, going on mm -hmm. and how absolutely... And so that is one of the things also due to this parenting style, Jody Hildebrandt has been recorded making extremely homophobic, transphobic, uh, even racist rants. Her basic style is that anything that falls away from her expectations is a choice that you've made and you should buck it up and traditional therapists just coddle their patients. It's a very tough love, but conditional love situation that's going on here. Um, mm. A link also, there's a heartbreaking, and I do mean heartbreaking interview with John, Dr. John DeLynn of Mormon Stories Podcasts, interviewing the niece of Jody Hildebrandt a young person who is now a tattoo artist somewhere up in the Pacific Northwest who had also been duct taped and left to sleep on a sleeping bag on a tiny little porch in the Utah winter. And it gets cold out there. And how, yeah. And, yeah. and we've heard that um, in Eight Passengers, she talked about making, um, I think, her oldest son sleep on a bean bag a bean without bag. a bed and yes for, for, for about a year um i'm not sure it was that long but it was pretty yeah. long and it was because he had been pranking his kids 
Um, then there was one where she was taking away Christmas from the eight-year-old, I believe, and one of the other younger children. And what she was going to give them was the gift of truth reflected back to them as to how their, quote-unquote, egregious behavior had been affecting the family. Hmm. Now, these are kids. They... They're still learning how to deal, but a lot of it seems to be there's there's two big words in Jody Hildebrandt's dictionary, and that is truth and distortion. Yeah. And anything that doesn't align with her very narrow worldview of how men and women should behave, and that's very quote unquote traditional values is in delusion and if you don't don't do or i'm sorry not delusion again um distortion 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 and you can't anything that has to do with any anything that she doesn't accept is distortion mm -hmm. so that if you're believing that it's okay to masturbate that's distortion if you believe that you're gay that's distortion she compared at one point in one video, I'll see if I can try to link it, homosexuality to having intercourse with an anthill or to the ground, I believe it was. I think having intercourse with an ant anthill could be quite painful. Actually. No, yeah. But, um, I don't I'm not going to try it, it, I can tell you that. It, it was um, ground, but the whole thing of taking things away from children, another kid, Pause, uh, case and by the way people who've been noticing there have been petitions going around for years now check this family out for child abuse mm -hmm. um and one of them was her six-year-old daughter who's supposed to be able to make her own lunch i don't know of a six i wasn't able to make my own lunch at six i mean i might have slapped some peanut butter on some bread but You'd no, I, I started cooking when I was eight, so I'd probably been able to make some fairy cakes for my lunch by then. But yeah. I, I think I was an exceptional eight-year-old. I think it's usually well, more you're like just nine. John. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But in any case, this young young kid forgot her lunch, and supposedly, according to her mother, said, "Well, she said she had it ready, and it's her responsibility." And then is taped in her car saying. My kid's teacher just called me. She's hungry. She doesn't have a lunch. I hope no one else steps up to give her some food. Mm. Yeah. Wow. I, I mean, I saw a, a, a news piece that where Ruby Frankie had said um, that the the conditions with which she treats her kids are because when one of them, and she's not saying which one was three years old they three years old they're exposed to pornography and since then have been abusing their siblings now we haven't heard anything about this in her various broadcasts before she's therapy for 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 couples when her own husband is is out of the house uh, reducing them to seven passengers from eight mm -hmm. um I mean, and and looking at her, looking at the when the she's not a size. therapist, she's a licensed coach. Jody Hildebrand is sadly a therapist, and I will break in here and say, here's the really scary, horrible thing, is that she is the go-to family therapist for high-level Mormons in the Salt Lake City area. If one of their apostles needs some help. She's the one they recommend. So many people have been writing in to Mormon stories, and I'll put a link to that, mm -hmm. saying she wrecked my marriage and it was because our bishop recommended her to us. And, mm -hmm. will, and Jody Hildebrandt will encourage the women to push their husbands away completely. But yeah. We come to a fundamental problem uh, you know uh, you you corrected me when when i said that some time ago that voltaire had said that when people believe absurdities they will commit atrocities and you referred me to a website which shows that he didn't actually said that he made a much more complicated statement than that in french which makes it even worse 
Um, but it's more simple. Le français c'est plus simple d'anglais. Yeah, and lots of I O N words that today you can't remember. Um, <laughs> they all come from French. Um, but instruction, désolation, they're all French. Um, so it's oh dear, we it we what's that thing? We're, this is cultural appropriation. We must stop using all I O N words and give them back to the French. Um, but we have the situation where you have a group of people who have absurd beliefs. They have beliefs that are at odds, <clears throat> not only with the society around them, but with the laws of the society around them. So in the United States, you also have, for example, the 12 tribes uh, who beat their children with paddles. Um, the Jehovah's Witnesses um, who actually if a child makes a noise during a, a service in a kingdom hall, they'll be taken into a back room and beaten so the congregation can hear their, their cries. I found that hard to believe, but I've now talked with enough former members to, to know that this is so. So this punitive attitude in Scientology, of course, you have the very strange belief that you are a, a fully competent being from the moment of birth. And that whatever you do, you are deciding to do. You're a Thetan. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm going to give an example of extraordinary child abuse that, that occurred because of this idea. Uh, I'm going to name the person because he's dead now. But a man called Lensworth Small, who was a lawyer running his own law firm, um, he <clears throat> was a Scientologist, a very dedicated Scientologist. And when his wife, who's a friend of mine, um, was not at home one night and their three-year-old daughter started to bang her head against the wall and cry out. <clears throat> he let her. He didn't go because she was deliberately being bad. She managed to incur brain damage in consequence. And so poor Fiona Small lived another 11 years. She died at the age of 14. She was not able to communicate uh, she was retarded. She was retarded because of a belief, because mm -hmm. her own father did not go and attend to her and comfort her. And seeing that attitude, I mean, this week I've talked with a, a young man who would rather remain nameless. He's not a young man anymore. I first met him in 1983 when he appeared at my doorstep because uh, his stepfather had said, if you want to leave Scientology, you can stay overnight there and then get the train home and on my doorstep was a 14 year old who told me that he was the second in command for Scientology in the UK he had a staff of more than 200 people and when I suggested to him that he was a little bit young to have such a responsibility he said oh no there are kids there are 12 year olds who are actually telling adults off for their sexual <clears throat> activities 12 year old comes in and tells you you shouldn't have been doing that so, you know, this pe peculiar idea about the responsibility of a child, um, I believe that you're born, I'm pretty sure, I've got four kids, you're born absolutely dependent. You know, you can't feed yourself, you can't move around, and you have to wear diapers. And for me, from that age up to when you achieve your majority, whether that's age 18, 21, or whatever, I tend to think that adulthood in, in human beings begins somewhere at about 35, but you know, which is the old Roman view, by the way. Um, but what you should be doing is, is giving more and more responsibility and helping the child to understand. Now, what we, what we see here is, you know, firstly, how on earth was a three-year-old watching pornography? What kind of responsible parent puts a child in that situation ever or even if the even if the child was watching pornography how would that child understand that this is a sexual act even comprehend what a sexual act mm -hmm. is if anything a three-year-old would probably go those adults are fighting or those adults are wrestling or just see a bunch of colors and on the screen and go Boy, they're wake making some weird noises. Absolutely. So, 
yeah and and you know unless you're sigmund freud and and believe that year old babies are trying to seduce their parents and i don't believe that um th this goes off into the area of crazy we have a set of absurdities watching ruby frankie in her you know various little film clips i've seen she has that bright look that i associate with people who are dishonest yeah um, they all had that bright big smile I oh i will uh, say that there's also the thing that you know that there can be cults within cults that are more controlling yes. because i know some mormons out here and they are not under the control of the temple and lead normal lives and believe normal mm -hmm. things it's all a matter of gradations with a lot of the bigger ones and I think that the Connections Camp is a cult within a bigger organization, and it's much more controlling when you get into that little Jody Hildebrandt cult. Mm -hmm. And Ruby Frankie was definitely a member of, is probably still in her mind, a member of the Jody Hildebrandt cult, or mm -hmm. they're a or they're a folie de doing this to each other. I haven't. Yeah dug bit deep enough to say but there seem to be little puddles of it as you say it fits in with with steve hassan our friend steve hassan's influence continuum exactly but the closer you get to the center of the group usually the exactly. more strange things become and mm -hmm. here we are seeing a woman two women who've actually been advocating what you and I would consider to be child abuse for years. The organization that should be giving the moral guidance. And, you know, if, if there is a function for religion in our society, it is surely that to provide moral guidance. Now we've seen that failure. We've seen yes. it in the Catholic church, just, unbelievably you know 500 priests charged with 8000 assaults mm -hmm. in australia alone portugal this year has uh, earlier in the year released a report about the predation of clergy lincoln description we've also, yeah we've also seen that in the anglican church in the methodist church in the baptist churches and of course mm -hmm. in the jehovah's witnesses and the mormons like the jehovah's witnesses refuse to hand over information about mm -hmm. these criminal acts to law enforcement, to actually allow law enforcement to get access to these records. There's a big battle that in, in Utah right now mm -hmm. to make them mandatory reporters, which I think is like the bottom line expectation that if you work with people and you hear about child abuse, you should be governmentally mandated to report it to someone, anyone. That should be the like the bottom line, barest expectations. And yet there that's there's a clergy exception. Hmm. I don't I, I know mean, if I, Mormons or everybody in Utah. I, I absolutely don't take Scientologist position. That, that you know you're born um, cognizant and responsible for what happens to you but on the other hand i do take the position that children should have the same benefits of law that adults have and so Protection, um, sure, surely yeah i i have four kids um all of them now adult um for the most part um in as much as i am myself um but i I've, I never hit one of my children. I never felt the need to hit one of my children. And I know that with my own mother, I'm the youngest of four and, and all three of my brothers were smacked and they probably deserved it knowing them. You know. um, no, it's not true. They're wonderful people. Um, I was never hit as a child because when my, one of my brothers <laughs> went to my mum and said, why don't you hit him? She said he hasn't done anything. I was I was a very good, obedient child. It didn't last, obviously, but when I was when I was little. And I think it it did make a difference. You know, when I went to school and you know, there I was hit only twice in the years I went to school, but it was such a shock to find myself in a place that wasn't safe. 
where irrational events were taken out on me with shouting on many occasions and being struck on on two occasions when I was six and when I was 13. And it makes you, it separates you from the group. It, it means that you become hyper vigilant. You know, you, you've got a kind of little bit of PTSD going on there. And so seeing that, that this is a regular way of treating people. And what my mother said to me when we talked about this many years later was, and, and she uh, actually took part in a, a report on um, the child and the young offender. Um, when she was uh, uh, sat on the city council in the town where I grew up. So she had some view of this. And when she talked about having smacked my brothers, she said that she always realized that it was because she'd lost control. It was because she was not providing the right guidance for my brothers, you know, to improve their behavior. Uh, they all did improve their behavior i'm happy to say but so so this idea of violence against children and then when we get to taking their beds away and punishing them this again throws us into something like the scientology's rehabilitation project force where you just give ever more severe penalties ultimately of course in scientology this led to the death of lisa mcpherson where she was um, tied down and died from dehydration while under the care of David Miscavige um, and his uh, cohorts. This idea that the more you brutalize somebody, the more likely it is that they will reform is an incredibly stupid idea. It is. Uh, I just had the thought that this is what must lead to the idea that the person who can beat the bejeebers out of you is somehow right. You see it in every superhero movie, every yeah. war movie. It's might makes right. The person who can brutalize the most and hit and subdue the person must be the person on the right side. And I think that's where it starts is a child is beaten by their parents and corrected and made to apologize for this brutality, because let's not forget that then the kid has to there think about what they've done and apologize to the parent after they've been brutalized. Mm -hmm. And it leads to this, um, you know, two grown men, two grown millionaires, we won't mention names, challenging each other to a cage match. Yeah, man pa passes misery on to man, it rises like a coastal shelf, in the words of Philip Larkin. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and, and I think we do. I think by passing trauma on from one generation to the next, and then grinning about it, as Ruby Frankie does, that we fail to understand, you know, that the Mormons are, are a sort of splinter group from Christianity, a serious splinter group, because of course they have their own scriptures. Um, but nonetheless, I, I'm an agnostic, as you know, but nonetheless, it seems to me, if, when I look at the Gospels, that, that this is meant to be a gospel of love, of care. You know, and that when Jesus says, you know, you know, how many times do you turn the other cheek a seven and even 70 times seven is what he says ah but and yet we have, have this strict mm -hmm. sorry spare the rod spoil the child yeah and that's in there too or i come not with a what is i come not in peace but with a sword i believe there's one line there yeah, i come to set father against son i'm going to separate the wheat from the chaff there are some pretty nasty lines in there almost but as I, if it wasn't written by one person <gasps> and it was written long after the events you know even though we're only dealing with you know tens of years after the events nonetheless and it was written you know th this is another whole subject but but the the Gospels, particularly the synoptics, uh, Matthew, Mark and Luke, are written with the idea of fulfilling prophecy. So stories that have been told in the Torah, the Pentateuch, the Old Testament, are now fitted 
to their um, Jesus, um, who was not only a Jew, by the way, but worshipped in the temple, and his followers, the Nazarenes, worshipped in the temple too, for anybody who's uh, feeling anti-Semitic. Um, but the, it is such, uh, you know, I think we have lived through millennia of tyranny. That's the human condition, being ruled by monarchs who, you look at any one of them and they're capricious and tyrannical, um, even, the, even the ones that seem nice, like say Ashoka, who brought Buddhism to all of India, having followed his father and conquered the lot of it. Um, but he maintained a secret police, despite having brought Buddhism, you know, so tyranny is, is, has not been helpful to humanity. And this idea of electing tyrants, putting people into positions where, where they can fulfill their authoritarian dreams which very often consist of you know taking away the rights of women um you know i live in a country that only you know until the end of the 19th century legally women were chattels they were movable goods and you could take your wife to the marketplace right into the 20th century and sell her do you know what year it was when women could f in this country could get a credit card of their own without their husband's permission? Was it 2022? No, but it was within my lifetime, 1972. Hmm. Yeah. And I I forget, but it's not so long ago that we were not considered chattels here either. Hmm. And I mean, if you look then to the position of, of the the Native Americans, is that the right expression? Am I allowed to say um, that? Actually, uh, if you go to somebody who's actually one of one of the Native Americans, they call themselves Indians because it's shorter and that's what they've gotten used to. And for but even they don't agree. That's the thing. Mm. So that it becomes, well, what shall I call you? And I call them Native Americans because that's what I was raised to think was mm. respectful, and I want to be respectful. And exactly, yeah. and that's 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 exactly what I seek to do. In Canada, they're being called First Nations people. Of course, which in I Australia, like. they're called Aborigines, which is is an accurate term, but has come to represent the natives of Australia rather than Aborigine, which means well, native. But um, that in eighteen seventy six, there was a law passed in Congress, which reduced all Native Americans to the status of children mm -hmm. of court. And it was only in the 1920s, they became citizens. So we've seen these oppressive ideas, which, um, you know, and the Mormons, of course, in their past have, have the guilt of having massacred uh, people, uh, among them Native Americans, a um, long time ago. But, not admitting black people to the clergy because of that mark of Cain slash people of mud doctrine that's been tucked nicely under the carpet. Yeah, I mean, in the, the Book of Mormon, there there is a passage which I believe was um, only moved out in the 1960s. I cited it elsewhere. Uh, again, saying that that, you know, black people can't be among the elect. Um, you know, the Jehovah's Witnesses had a similar idea. Oh. Um, if we are to move into a secular society where, you know, people actually have rights and children have rights, we have to get rid of these old fashioned, unuseful, anti-human ideas. Well, also the idea that somehow being horribly strict to a child being cruel to them to be kind, teaching them our values, values by pushing them down, teaching the value of responsibility to a child, to a six-year-old by starving her. There was, there's another really chilling one, I don't know if you saw it, where Ruby Frankie is standing, fully clothed in her shower, one of the daughters has said that she has blurry vision and needs to go to the hospital. And um, since my cataract surgery, I've heard that sudden blurry vision is something that you do need to go to the hospital right away for. Of course. Um, 
but she says, well, give me an hour, and then is standing, filming herself in a shower, fully clothed, going, well, I'm just waiting here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let her wait with the same cheerful grin. Mm. Yeah. Also, the idea of children as pawns, mm. as soldiers. Now, I can understand that developmentally or evolutionary speaking we're just only coming out of a place where before we got medicine how many what percentage of children actually lived to to adulthood it was well, before samuel vice got yeah. his point over that doctors ought to wash their hands before <laughs> It's pathetic. It's like, oh my God, what grief. I've never had children, but I can't even imagine losing a child, even very young. It would be heartbreaking. I mean, my heart breaks every time one of my parakeets passes on and they only live eight to 13 years. So that's, but to see to see that these children are somehow expendable, they're tools, they're extensions of the parents in the quiverful movement. You have lots of them because that's what you have to do. And the older ones are immediately put in as the caregivers of the younger ones. Yeah. And particularly if they're female, it's just expected you're going to be second mommy or even primary mommy to all the all the younger ones that mom pops out. And if she doesn't have a baby at least every year and a half, something's wrong. She's in sin. And the and they're raising these children for God. They're, in their own words, raising an army for God. Mm. And a lot, of, and to simply go, well, we can't afford children is to lack faith in God. Cannon fodder for God. Oh, mm. so, yeah, but the view of children as products for god as th these are your property i mean one of the most curious documentaries i've ever seen was was about a reform school in england called pepper harrow that's a single p in the middle pepper harrow and um the film the original film was made in the 1970s and what appeared to have happened was that a bunch of hippies had set up a reform school and uh, I was a little surprised by this film because one of the things that particularly surprised me that was an eight-year-old kid walking around smoking a cigarette with nobody telling him not to, which I think is probably a little too liberal, even from my way of thinking. But they then went back some years later, I mean, 20 years later or something, and filmed again. And the first thing they pointed out was that Pepper Harrow had a reoffence rate of 10%. They then interviewed, I think, four of the six children who'd been in the original. Uh, one had died, of the six had died, and another didn't want to be filmed. And they found that these, you know, there was a kid who at 14 was in there. He could not read and write. He was the youngest of four kids, all with different dads. And he was going out stealing to feed his siblings and his mum. And he got caught and sent to Pepper Harrow. Now, we see him later on in life, and he's actually the top man in, in the childcare system in a county in England. And that, so there's what happened, treating these kids with tremendous tolerance and, and care, that there were no punishments of the, of, you know, they were not being confined, they were certainly not being beaten, they were not being shouted at, so they were kindly treated. By comparison, the Margaret Thatcher's government under a man called William Whitelaw introduced what he called the short, sharp shock, um, which is a quotation from the Mikado by Gilbert and Sullivan mm -hmm. and actually means execution. But he thought it was funny to apply it in this way. Under the short, sharp shock regime, which is a version of the American Brat Camp or Troubled Teen Industry, which we have a video going up about um under that system the rear fence rate went to 80 percent so you kind of go so by brutalizing kids we know it's 
the evidence is there it doesn't work again with was it mendota we always have trouble mendota, with this yeah we always forget the name and i have to look it up fresh and everything <laughs> but i think we've got it now finally that they did a study it's a reform school and they did a study of kids who who had the, the normal treatment in reform schools and kids who were, were treated with tremendous you know they had counselors and 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 there, there were a bunch of murders from the control group and none in the, the kids who've been treated which, which starts to say that you know as you know at the moment as everybody who's watching the channel knows i am totally embroiled in the the life and times of charles manson and it, i didn't intend to be it was accidental you know because my friend jolly west my late friend jolly west was accused of having in some way brought the manson family into being as a part of the cia's mk ultra operation which is nonsense um but it suddenly i found myself looking at manson and going why aren't people talking about his profound involvement with scientology mm -hmm. you know 54 years later why aren't they talking about that and in studying his life and finding out the childhood he had you know i mean the the, the book i'm writing provisionally the, the first chapter is called a bad child badly treated you know he does not seem to have ever been anything but a conniving self-centered individual do you um, think some people are some people are just born that way well psychopathy is is an innate condition that's true which is said to involve three alleles genetically um and a defic deficiency in the connection between the old brain and and the prefrontal cortex that's the the thinking part of the brain uh systems called the paralimbic system and you know kent keel has done lots of i think he did more than 500 mris of psychopaths finding that this connection was there i think there's a bit more controversy about genetic alleles i'm not sure yeah. that we're we going to can... stick with that idea for much we longer can bring in james fallon who found hmm. out that he had those alleles but had been raised by his mother very carefully so that he wouldn't yeah and he's very definitely you know a fascinating case so yeah. you can be you can be born with it but always come back to shakespeare you know some are born great some achieve greatness some have greatness thrust upon them and i think it's the same with most conditions in human beings that some things you're born into but if you're in, in during your infancy during the first five years of your life there is strong evidence that if during that period you are treated abusively you're treated aggressively you're not allowed to there are no loving relationships in your life that whether you were born with the condition or not you will not trust people mm -hmm. and on the other hand cult members tend to be people who've been brought up to trust they tend to be people who want to do good in the world they tend to you know, people who join cults, people are born into cults, you know, different situation. But and they're also taught to believe that the children are supposed to be use, used for the service of whatever the organization is to service of. Yeah. So, and so kids who are Jehovah's Witnesses will be sent out knocking on doors to mm -hmm. make and recruits. Yeah, and the not... Mormons will be sent away from home for two years and not allowed to contact their families during that period as missionaries. Mm -hmm. um, Utah and Arizona communities exchange people. We, we get American Mormons over here. Um, mm -hmm. And which seems to me remarkably cruel, you know, to to take a child away, you know, a teenager away from familial. Well, it's a control thing too. You're ta you're isolating them. They're also got a buddy that they can't get away from, mm -hmm. and they're not allowed their traditional support system. It's like any abusive relationship. The first thing you do is take away the person's support systems, mm -hmm. and then isolation, dependency, and dread. Exactly. Three point model. Yeah. I want to ask you a question, though, because I'm sure that some other people will be going, oh, well, it's all very well and good to say don't beat the children and treat them kindly. However, I was at a store at one 
a long time ago and there was this child running amok with a ski pole. It was a skiing store. We have skiing up here where I am. And he was running amok with a ski pole, waving it around and nearly poking it into people, knocking over displays. And all his parents were doing was sitting back going, now, Jason, we don't do that. So where is the balance? What what do you do to keep the child from doing that other than grabbing and smacking, which I know is not right, but. Well, I, yeah, you, you restrain the child from doing harm. You take the ski pole away from them. And if they're old enough to talk about it, you talk about it now. I'll tell you something from my own life. My my daughter, my lovely daughter, when she was seven, I think it would have been, um, we went into um, a Woolworths. Remember Woolworths? Oh, yes. Uh, and yeah, long gone now, except for the Woolworths, wonderful Woolworths building in New York. What a great piece of architecture. But anyway, we were in a Woolworths and um, she picked up a pair of um adult high heels which were you know plastic Woolworths sort of cheap five pounds and demanded that i buy them for her and she then started crying she sat on the floor crying her eyes out and i sat down with her and of course people who don't have children walk past tutting at me for being such a rotten parent the stink eye. And people who, who did have children gave me sympathetic looks and i just waited until she'd stopped crying and i said to her i will never buy you anything if you cry to get it you have to ask me and then i'll think about it and the next day she said can i have that pair of shoes they were five pounds so we went and bought them what is interesting about this is from that day onward she never had a tantrum with me interesting she she frequently had tantrums with her mother. Ah, huh. interesting. And so it, I think you have to lay down boundaries and you, you have to keep your promises. You know, if you say, I'll kill you if you do that again, I'm afraid you have to kill the child. You know, just go uh, break your, your arm. Is yeah, just wonderful. don't offer violence to children, don't threaten them with that. And of course, you shouldn't be giving them treats. I mean, one of the errors I, I've often seen in, in child rearing is where a child is told they can't have something and then it's given to them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So be reliable in, in, yeah. the, in the way you treat your children and always look to understand why they're behaving the way they're behaving. And, you know, of course you, you offer carrots, but, you know, carrots are not particularly liked by children so that may not be the best good with donkeys though uh but you don't need to offer the stick yeah you can take away privileges um and and uh, you know we've come into a, a brave new world that, that the the way that the computer particularly via the smartphone and the tablet has changed society mm -hmm. um i was talking with Hoyt richards a good friend hoyt uh last year i think it was and, and he was saying, you know, are we coming to a point where we're going to be, you know, cybernetically connected? I'm like, we already are. <laughs> yeah, it's just not yeah. wound into our bodies, actual bodies yet. Yeah. And I, I, I mean, there was a there was a study where, uh, which was a study of advertising, in fact, and seeing what effect smartphones had on people. And one group of people had their smartphones taken away and they were all being paid if they completed i think it was an hour without their smartphones they got something like 150 dollars and this woman after i think it was 11 minutes came out of the room and said give me my phone back give me my phone back so we see people becoming dependent upon these devices and we do see the interference that 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 has with parenting you know yeah, totally guilty. I'm addicted to this stupid game on my smartphone. I was just thinking, you couldn't take it away from me for any amount of money during the three day stretch that uh, one of these this game has events that you have to keep playing during this three day stretch. Nope, sorry, don't take it away from me. Um, 
the other thing that I was thinking is, should we at this point bring up Judy from the Righteous Gemstones? We're going to be doing a show on the Righteous Gemstones at some point. And uh, John made me get HBO. Of course, Jay. How much is it costing you? It's a fortune. Actually, you know, isn't it? th thank you so much because I've been watching all of South Park again and also several movies that I'd forgotten. We've got the the White Lotus is on there. Uh, Succession. I haven't seen that yet. I'm, but I'm going to. But Judy is almost always ignored by her parents, hmm. and yet always allowed to just throw these massive, massive tantrums. And the first episode, you feel kind of sorry for her because the guys have gone off. To China. to China and yeah. she comes back going oh, well I wasn't allowed to go and her brothers are going yeah because it's man's work and yes. then later on in the series I turned to Wally my dear husband and said well of course they didn't take Judy to China because the minute somebody told her no it would have been a freaking diplomatic incident this woman as soon as she's told no punches kicks there's one scene where she breaks the door of a bus just because it didn't open for her fast enough yeah what, what's called oppositional behavior by some psychiatrists and and is seen as to presage sociopathy or, or psychopathy in later life that that um and again with charles manson look you know we we have access to his juvenile records and um the, the number of people who said he just can't do as he's told he has oh. to do something else he is in comp in opposition which frankly given the vicious way he was treated mm -hmm. I mean, he was bloodied and beaten in a catholic reform school at the age of 12 and it it just carried on from there though i did want to get back to judy that the ignoring her is another mm -hmm. form of child abuse yeah. Just the and, pushing her aside. Was it because she was a girl or was it because she was difficult? I still haven't figured out. Yeah, I mean, they're all pretty difficult one way or another, the gemstone children. But um, you know, one's, <laughs> one's heart goes out to poor John Goodman, who, as well as in you know playing a, a total con man who's bilking people of their money, also has these awful children, you know, but so it goes. Um, yeah, we we see it all around us, and I, so I think the thing is, you know, the the takeaway, as Americans say, to us that's food, but the takeaway from this uh, takeout to you, takeaway to us, takeout, takeaway, yeah. the takeaway is is that we should all, I think, as members of society, feel responsible for children, the children of our society. An example for me, this has not happened recently. Um, because I don't go to the big city all that much. But it, it used to be that I'd, there'd be some mother with a three-year-old and, and the mother would say, well, I'm going now if you don't want to come with me. And I would find myself between the cars and the child walking towards the mother to make sure that the child didn't mm -hmm. go into the road. And it shocked me that there could be anybody who didn't realize that if a car hits a child, and when I was a kid, my best friend's little brother twice walked in front of vehicles. I think he did a lot more damage to the vehicles than to himself. He was a very sturdy young man. But the, this is not a good situation. And the thought that you don't love your child enough to protect them from potential immediate harm, that your level of exasperation has risen so high you know, and, and the way that people will shout at their children using words that the children can't possibly understand, concepts that are, that are beyond them, mm -hmm. um, you know, it, it, it shocks me. So we should care for our children. And if we suspect that abuse is taking place, we should report it. Oh, yeah. I think every every one of us should be mandated yeah. reporters or I mean, like I said, I don't have children, but there's right now a whole wad of uh i don't know why there's only one girl and about 17 gazillion boys in my neighborhood right now but that's the way it is and right beyond this door here is a very narrow 
very steep dirt path that goes up to our community pool that the boys like to play and use their bike the crash their bikes down and a little while ago i heard you know ah, meaning and you better damn well bet i ran outside mm, of course and they looked at me and they were kind of scared and the first thing words out of my mouth is nobody's in trouble i just want to make sure that you're okay mm. And as it turned out, there was a skinned knee. And I told the kid, go back to your parents and ask for a Band-Aid. But as far as I'm concerned, you're all right. And you have now learned the lesson why you don't ride down that hill at breakneck speed. Mm. Yeah. I mean, the simplest of concepts is, you know, we can be asocial and do nothing. Mm -hmm. We can be antisocial and cause harm to others. Mm -hmm. We can be pro-social. And... My experience of life and my contentment in life, and I am at the age of 68, a fairly happy person. My contentment in life is in the, in the positive relationships that I have with other people. And you do that by being positive in your relationship to other people, you know, by going, yeah, it's the middle of the night and I wish you hadn't called me, but can I help? You know? Yeah, exactly. So exactly. If anybody's thinking of calling me, I'm not releasing my number. <laughs> <laughs> I switch my phone off. So, well, the other thing is the fact that in certain certain religions, children are also viewed as willful and needing to be punished in order mm -hmm. to be good, but also that the faith has said, like, take Jehovah's Witnesses and shunning your children. Yeah, I have I've, heard I've met with so that many so many sad, times. So, so many always sad that, me. that the, the, the parent will say, well, actually, in the new system, that is their version of paradise, God will provide me another child and I will forget about you. Or our friend Catherine Spolino, who wrote the excellent book, Bad Cadet, who is excellent. a survivor of of Scientology, she feels the reason that her parents are okay with having cut her out is because there are these immortal beings that will live for trillions of trillions of years mm -hmm. and have had billions of children before and will have billions of children afterwards. And what is one child out of that? Yeah. And, uh, you know, for anybody who's religious who's watching and who thinks that, uh, they're going to escape this rotten life into a, a wonderful life. Well, okay, maybe. I don't think so. I think this is not a rehearsal. I think this is actually reality that we're in. And, and it means that we should do the best we can because putting aside the selfish individualism of going to heaven or, or being reincarnated or what have you. And laughing and at all the people who are in hell. <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, it used to be that um, they're revealing apocalypses that are, that are painted. And apocalypse, I, I found this out the other day, it means revelation. But it, it, it's come to mean something rather nasty. But a lot of English churches, that paintings were painted, whitewashed over after the Puritans took over in the 1640s. And some of these are being restored. And I thought at first that, that they exist to scare parishioners into behaving in a moral way so that they'll go to heaven. But that's not what they're there for. They're there so that the parishioners who have rotten lives can gloat about what will happen to the other people when they die. And I don't think that's a very Christian idea. Well, that's um, the one thing that Jehovah's Witnesses actually do have that's positive is they don't believe in hell. Yeah, good for them. Yeah, but on the other hand, only 144,000 of the elect will will go to the proper paradise. And, and the rest of us will confusing. live on Earth. Yeah. Mm. And also have to clean away all the bodies. And also, I've heard from many of them that they would go and they'd look at a nice house and go, after Armageddon, that's going to be my house. You just have to go and clean away the bodies. Look. Looking forward to that. Even King's the Stand all over again. Yeah. So <sighs> if, the, if there is eternity, then there's an eternal now. And as I say, putting aside selfish individualism, if we believe that we are part of the tapestry of humanity rather than being so important that we'll live forever and that we are there for 
vital. What we do, what we think, what we say is vital to the future of humanity for every one of us, every one of us. And that means living a virtuous life for the sake of the smugness that it gives you <laughs> to say, yeah, I've been virtuous. Um, but for the sake of of the greater society of of humanity and uh we don't think that ruby frankie's made a very good job of it and i hope um, that whatever it is, I, I hope that her children will receive help well there um, was the thing is that the girl it took her several hours while she's starving and wrapped up and beaten took her several hours to accept medical help because she did not believe she deserved it yeah, and, it's like, like one and of the like, prostitutes one of the prostitutes who was in the chinese thought reform camps um when they were first started at around about 1950 and uh they were meant to treat these people kindly and i think they often tried to and after um this guy was trying to get her to tell him about herself and she was completely silent. She wouldn't, you know, wouldn't respond to him. And eventually she burst out and she said, look, you're wrong. The reason that I'm a prostitute is nothing to do with the society and, and where we live, the situation in which I was born. It's my bad karma. I deserve this. Yeah. So when you have a, a belief that's of that kind, you know, as in Scientology, the idea that you pulled in anything bad that happens to you and it's because of Ron Hubbard, anything good that happens to you. We start getting into this, you know, the just world idea that um, bad things only happen to bad people. And, you know, and I think it's, it's pretty obvious looking at Genghis Khan, Hitler, Mao and Stalin, that yeah. bad things don't all that readily happened to bad people they would not have lived as long as they did if if that were the truth so you know it's up to us it's up to us to be responsible i will link jody hildebrandt's niece's talk with uh dr john delin here because they pronouns are them they um mm. said that for a very long time they felt as if they were responsible for Which is a, such a normal they were trap. the lowest yeah. horrible people mm -hmm. also i often wonder what happened to that four-year-old that went into the locker for what was it just tearing up some of elron's scribblings or spilling ink uh yeah the um i and i don't know um but, but yeah what... and when you when you see a picture of what the chain locker was aboard uh Ron Hubbard's yeah. ship and the idea that he would put this child of four in there for several days, screaming, whimpering and crying is, is just because unconscionable. It, because it had chosen to do that. Yeah, mm. I remember being a four year old and scribbling on paper because I liked to scribble on paper. It wasn't. Mm. Uh, but to carry that guilt, to be told you are a horrible little cringy little thing what is the um what is that very famous sermon sinners in the hands of an angry god mm. it's that paternal you're bad god is great and the parents have to turn away from their own children in order to be good members of this group because mm. often the parents are so call them brainwashed call them under control call them so tired that they can't even think straight mm -hmm. themselves they they yeah. lose they they think that they're actually helping by doing this yeah. i mean and, and these aberrative systems teach them that and they teach them and here's the horror to glory in um in hurt to to feel that you know righteousness about harming other people and we have to be so careful about about that i was talking with um dr moffick the other day and uh, this will go up before that does and and we disagreed over the word hate because i take the point of view that hate is a bad thing 
and that's that. And and he was sort of well, but it can be right to hate something that's bad. And I said, well, that's I'm going to separate that off, and I call that indignation, which I think is perfectly correct. I think hatred is is a more primal instinct that it you know, and while we may dislike something and feel a dislike of it, a disgust of it, an aversion, we can then rationally consider it and take steps to do something about it. I feel that hate, we will tend, as these parents are doing with their children, to just strike out, to, to assert our authority and our righteousness mm -hmm. without looking at the consequences of what we're doing and without, without acting from a place of love, from a place of care, but and also righteous self-righteousness takes over also the holding of violence as a threat to encourage mm. correct behavior but the idea that you can threaten somebody with the wooden spoon and this wooden spoon will be thwacking you or making the child uh, this is one that i a trope that i've heard about for a very long time making the child go go cut the switch that they will be beaten with and that that is somehow acceptable to encourage good behavior because i am able to hurt you thus yeah. you must behave yeah so um, yeah so we're against it and uh, i we're think that's, it. that's well, probably what we'd like is is if there are any mormons out there if there's somebody who's knowledgeable about this i would love to talk with you and uh, air that conversation um, so that we might better understand the mm -hmm. details of what has happened here and, and, and whether this is, I mean, as, as we've said, um, Hildebrand is, is the go-to counsellor for, for the, the, the Mormon leadership. So, you know, mm -hmm. anything more we can find out about that would be useful. Uh, uh, Dr. DeLynn actually did have a, uh, an, a active Mormon therapist on his show. He actually talks with active believing Mormons, which mm -hmm. I totally salute because yeah, not friend. all of them are hard. There, there's some lovely, wonderful, good, courageous people there. Yeah. Um, and she was saying that she was running a, a therapy session and saying that now if you're a therapist, you have to, if somebody comes to you as gay, you have to affirm, okay, it's all right to be gay. And some of the therapists were pushing back on that going, well, then I can't be a Mormon and a therapist. She's like, no, you just have to put your faith aside and yeah. allow your patient to have the, the therapeutic space that it's okay for them to be gay. And that's totally separate from your belief as a Mormon. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I um, became active in my annoyance against a, a Roman Catholic physician who had told a woman that she must not have a termination. Mm -hmm. And I wrote to him and pointed out that it was not his right to say and if, that as he had a religious belief, he should not impose that upon patients. Mm -hmm. And um, that's, you know, that's very much my perception. Also, you know, if I'm dealing with somebody who has a set of beliefs, then I expect them to act within that set of beliefs. So, you know, the famous therapist Rollo May, um, who um, gave us a form of therapy that, that basically it's, well, obviously you're in trouble because your worldview is wrong. Here's my worldview and you just believe these sensible things and called it existential therapy. And that is such an arrogant position to take, though Rollo May was a very intelligent man, that, you know, I've sorted the world out and everything. No, that's the I whole haven't. basis of this, though, is we have the answers and we've got to make these these square children fit into a round peg somehow. Or these round children fit into a square hole. Square peg, yeah, yeah. It just, We're not going to fit them into the peg spike. And what can they, I say? If they, if they don't, oh, you're right. I'm sorry. No, no, that's some com comedy for us there, right there. Well, I mean, like I'm wearing my Rubik's. We can put that up as a short, you know. I want to make a point: is that I found the quickest way to solve the Rubik's cube was to tear it apart and put it. Back 
together again. Now that's not a that's not a way to treat well, a human being. Yeah, actually, I had a young man who, who when when I was away once, he took apart he he tore all the the coloured things off the Rubik's cube and stuck them back in the right place, which is easier than tearing the cube apart. I think so. Oh. Try that maybe, or you could just get some paint. You know. Or, or if you're really evil, you just change one of the stickers so that it can't be solved at all. God, you are a bad person. What I am a horrible person. Mm. But the point I'm making is that Terry Pratchett had this where he used to say, there's two kinds of people. The people who say, people are this way, how can we change them? Mm. Or the people who say, people are this way, how can we work? with that or where should we lock them up in some cases but um there we go anyway this has been um it's not been fun but no, it has been real no. it has it been has, real and it has been interesting so so thank you very much and um we'll see everybody at the other side of the bridge no that's no that's no, not right won't. is it i will say that i believe that if you're good and you help your fellow person and you do everything right when you die you get to be reborn as a cat with kindness as your king <laughs> you will enter heaven before you reach your end dave matthews fair enough okay thanks a lot spike yeah thank you hi john here thanks for watching We'd appreciate it very much if you would click like, as well as subscribe, and click the bell for notifications. Every dollar helps, and we welcome new patrons on Patreon. Or you can make a one-off payment with any currency through PayPal. Thanks so much. Looks. Looking forward to that.